Greetings and welcome to our next reading of A Jataka Tale, which of course is one of the tales that was written to uh, reflect an incarnation of the Buddha and to, um, to teach a specific lesson that can be learned through this particular story. And our story for today is The Man Eater of Jambudipa, the Maha Sutasoma Jataka. And so I want to go ahead and pull that up for us as our slideshow, and we can get started. So as always, we um, this is a collective reading. It's a reading and a meditative practice. So I encourage you to sit comfortably wherever you are. We always take a deep cleansing breath before we begin our story. So let's do that now. We're gonna breathe in deeply through our nose and we'll release it through the nose as well. Here we go. Nice, so that just kind of, kind of helps us to settle in, settle in together. And the reason being that we do uh, read the story aloud and we have uh, a series of characters in each story and you can actually choose which character you would like to read aloud as. And you can also read aloud as more than one character. You can read aloud as all the characters, or you can read it aloud along with me as the narrator. But through the story, um, you're going to see the name of your character. It's going to be in red, and that'll give you a clue that you have some text coming up. So get ready to read. So our characters today are the Buddha. Then we have the character of the general, Kalahati, who's also known as commander in chief. Then we have um, Angulimala. Then we have the bhikkhus, the royal cook, um, Porasada, Brahmadatta, and Sutta Soma. So these are all of our characters. And as I said, you can feel free to choose one of those characters or as many as you like to read aloud as. So let's begin our tale. It was while staying in Jetavana that the Buddha told this story about Venerable Angulima. One of the advisors of King Pasanati had a son named Ahimsaka. He was an intelligent youth, and when he was old enough, he was sent to Takasila for his education. He proved to be an exceptional student, so much so that his fellow students were jealous of him and spread a rumor that he was having an affair with the teacher's wife. The teacher believed the gossip and was enraged. Wanting to have his star pupil killed, he devised a wicked plan. Rather than accepting money, the teacher told Ahimsaka that the fee for his studies was 1,000 fingers, one from each victim that he killed. Bound to his teacher by a pledge of honor, the poor young man could see no alternative but to comply. Ahimsaka returned to Savati and began his bloody quest. He became a brutal and merciless killer, attacking anyone he could find on the highways around the capital. Utterly fearless, he was known to attack groups of 10, 20, and 30, sparing no one. Villages became deserted and people were terrified to travel. At first, Ahimsaka hung the fingers on a tree, but crows ate them. In order to keep count of his victims, he started to wear a garland mala of fingers, anguli, around his neck, and he became known as Angulimala. Terrorized, the people demanded that the king catch Angulimala and stop his killing spree. When Angulimala's mother heard that the king himself intended to catch the murderer, suspecting him to be her own son, she set out to warn him. By this time, Angulimala had collected 999 fingers. He needed only one more to reach his goal. When he saw his mother, he decided to kill her as his final victim. That morning, when the Buddha surveyed the world, he saw the mass murderer, and he knew that he would attempt to kill his own mother. Knowing that Angulimala was ripe for insight but would fall into hell if he committed matricide, the Buddha set out to save him. 
When Angulimala saw the Buddha walking alone, he thought it would be very easy to kill him. So he abandoned the idea of killing his mother and ran after the Buddha instead. With his supernatural power, the Buddha prevented Angulimala from catching him, no matter how fast the bandit ran. Frustrated, Angulimala shouted, stop, Bhikkhu, stop. I have stopped, Angulimala, the Buddha calmly replied. Now you must stop. Puzzled by this, but knowing that Bhikkhu told the truth, Angulimala asked, what do you mean? I have completely stopped all violence toward living beings, the Buddha replied. You go on killing. I have stopped, Angulimala. You have not stopped. At long last, a sage has come to the great forest for my sake, Angulimala declared. Having heard your admonition from now on, I will abandon evil. He hurled his sword and other weapons over a cliff, paid homage at the Buddha's feet and asked for ordination. Come, Bhikkhu, the Buddha declared, and Angulimala was instantly provided with all the requisites. For some time, even though Venerable Angulimala was a fully ordained bhikkhu, many people still thought of him as the vicious murderer and refused to offer alms. Later, however, by making, an, by making an asseveration of truth, Venerable Angulimala saved the life of a woman and her baby during a difficult and dangerous delivery. When this became well known, devotees began paying him a great deal of respect, and he easily obtained alms. Venerable Angulimala cultivated solitude for intensive meditation, and in no long time, he achieved arahats. One day in the Hall of Truth, bhikkhus were talking about Venerable Angulimala. It was a miracle, friends, one bhikkhu said, that the Buddha peacefully reformed and humbled the cruel and blood-stained murderer that Angulimala was before. Truly, Buddhas do mighty works. When the Buddha heard what they were discussing, he said, there is no marvel, bhikkhus, in my converting him now that I am enlightened. I also tamed him when I had only limited knowledge. Then the Buddha told this story of the path. Long, long ago, when Brahmadatta was reigning in Varanasi, the Bodhisattva was born as the son of King Kauravya in Indapata, the capital of the Kuru Kingdom. Because he was fond of so much use, he was called Prince Sutasoma. His father sent him to Takasila for his education. At the same time, King Brahmadatta sent his son, Prince, Prince Brahmadatta, here for his studies too, and the two princes traveled on the same road. Sutasoma, being the brightest student, soon gained proficiency in every subject. Because Prince Brahmadatta was his close friend, Sutasoma acted as his private tutor so that Brahmadatta also made exceptional progress while the others learned satisfactorily on their own. Eventually, they all completed their studies and left to return to their own kingdom. As they parted company, Sutrasoma urged them all to keep the precepts, particularly to abstain from taking any life and to observe Uposatha days. He especially urged Brahmadatta to maintain his virtue because being adept at seeing the future by reading various signs, he knew that his friend would face great danger after he became King of Kasi. All his life, Prince Brahmadatta had eaten meat at every meal, and he continued this custom after becoming king. For full moon days, when no animals were slaughtered, the royal cook always procured the king's meat in advance and put it aside. Once, when the man was careless, Palace dogs sneaked into the kitchen, got hold of the meat, and ate it all. The frightened cook searched all over the city but was unable to find any meat. If I don't serve the king meat for his dinner, he will kill me, fretted the cook. What can I do? In desperation, in the middle of the night, the cook went stealthily to the charnel ground outside the city walls. There he found the exposed corpse of a man who had just died and sliced off a piece of flesh from the thigh with his cleaver. Then he hurried back to the palace without letting anyone see him. 
The next day, he chopped the flesh into small pieces so that it could not be recognized, roasted it thoroughly, and served it to the king as though it were ordinary meat. In a previous birth, King Brahmadatta had been a yaka who had devoured vast quantities of human flesh. As soon as a tiny piece of this meat touched his tongue, the king felt a thrill throughout his body. Though he did not realize what it was, that first taste of human flesh immediately reawakened his past addiction. How can I get the cook to tell me what kind of meat this is, wondered the king. Without swallowing that mouthful, he spat the meat onto the floor. When the cook saw that, he said, Sire, there is nothing wrong with that meat. You can safely eat it. The king said to the cook, of course, it is not spoiled, but please tell me what kind of meat it is. It is what your majesty has enjoyed every day, the cook answered evasively. You have never served me meat with a flavor like this before, King Brahmadatta protested. The cook realized that he could no longer conceal the truth. Begging for mercy, he confessed what he had done. Never mention a word of this to anyone, the king whispered. From now on, you can cook as usual for everyone else, but you must prepare human flesh like this for me every day. Sire, the cook protested, that would be very difficult. Not at all, the king assured him. There is nothing to worry about. It will be very easy. Where can I get human flesh every day? The cook asked, trembling. Aren't there a lot of men in prison? The king asked with a chuckle. The king then ordered the cook to conceal himself in dark alleys and every night to kill some solitary pedestrian for butchering. A great angry crowd rushed to the palace and demanded that the king do something about this abomination. What can I do, asked the king. I don't know who it is or where he's going to strike next. Do you want me, your king, to patrol the city every night? The people were disgusted by the king's indifference and appealed to the commander in chief, General Kalahati, to capture the serial killer. Kalahati took their complaint very seriously. Give me seven days, he told the citizens. I will arrest this killer and bring him to justice. He immediately ordered his soldiers to patrol all the city streets at night and to capture the man-eating murderer without fail. That night, the cook attacked the woman who was hurrying home at dusk. He was so busy that he did not see the soldiers approaching. They seized him and beat him severely. They tied his hands behind his back and shouted, we've caught the man-eater. Hanging the basket of flesh around the cook's neck, the soldiers dragged him before the commander in chief. You have been caught red-handed, General Kalahati said to the cook, so we know for sure that you killed this woman. Tell me, have you been killing these men and women and eating them yourself? Or is someone paying you to do it? I didn't slay this woman for myself, the cook maintained, nor did I kill her for money. I have committed one murder every night at the command of our sovereign. It is he who is eating human flesh. I am merely his cook. Take me before the king as soon as possible tomorrow morning, the cook continued. I will accuse King Brahmadatta, I will accuse King Brahmadatta to his face. You'll see that I am telling the truth. The commander in chief put the cook in a cell and had him closely guarded all night. By dawn, the whole city was in an uproar. Everyone had heard about the cook's catch. King Brahmadatta had breakfasted the day before, but had gone without a supper. He had sat up the whole night expecting his cook to come at any moment. At that moment, General Kalahati burst through the door and led the cook into the king's chamber. Sire, the general said coldly, this man, your cook, says that he was sent into the streets to kill innocent men and women, your loyal subjects, to furnish you with human meat. Please, your majesty, assure us that this is not true. It is true the king replied without offering any excuse. It was indeed done at my request. The cook is not to blame. I can't stop. No matter what you say, I can't give it up. I can't stop myself. 
Sire, pleaded the commander in chief, if you don't stop, you will destroy both yourself and your realm. General, replied the king, I can't help it. Even if I lose my kingdom, I cannot possibly control my craving. General Kalahati summoned the king's family and all the members of the court who soon appeared in their finest formal wear. The commander in chief pointed to the queen, the handsome princes, the lovely princesses and all the king's attendants and said, your majesty, here is your beloved family. Here are your advisors and all your attendants. This is all you have ever dreamed of having. You are the great king of Kasi. To maintain this magnificent status, you must give up this craving for human flesh. This is your last chance. The king waved his hand over the entire assembly and said, none of this is dearer to me than human flesh. From that day, Brahmadatta became known as Horisada, the cannibal. He lived in the jungle at the foot of a banyan tree. Every day, he hid by the roadside waiting for travelers. After he had killed his victim, he took the body to the cook who butchered it, cooked it, and served it to him as though he were still a king. Throughout Jambudipa, people were talking about the cannibal lurking in that great stretch of jungle who was killing travelers and eating their flesh. In the jungle, Corasada was sitting under a banyan tree. Having rekindled his fire, he was sharpening another spit. The man-eater looked up from his work and saw his old friend, Sutasoma walking toward the tree. Old friend, Sutasoma called out. You may kill me as a sacrifice to satisfy your addiction to human flesh. This king is fearless, Horisada thought. His speech shows that he has overcome all fear of death. I wonder how he got this power. Aloud, he said, the fire is not ready yet. By waiting until the coals are really hot, we will in no way compromise the sacrifice. This man-eater is extremely wicked, Sutasoma thought. Now is my chance to make him feel ashamed and to make him change. He said aloud, of all the sweet things in this world, none is sweeter than the joy of truth. He continued with a face as radiant as the full moon. Those wise sages who abide in the truth are able to escape from birth and death and win the further shore. Sutasoma, you are very skillful with words and your voice is as sweet as honey, Purasada declared with honest admiration for his, for, for his former tutor. How is it that you can stand there watching me fan this fire and sharpen this spit and not fear death? How is it that you can turn your back on worldly pleasures without hesitation and face death without a qualm? Does this fearlessness come from the four truths of Pasapa Buddha? I have done innumerable virtuous deeds, Sutta Soma replied, and my generosity is well known. I have taken care of my parents, been loyal to my friends and relatives, and ruled with righteousness and justice. I have confidence in the path that I have laid to the next world. Why should I have any fear of death? With no regrets, I'll make my way to heaven. After a slight pause, Purasada humbly declared, Sire, when men hear the truth, they may learn to distinguish good from evil. If I could hear those truths, perhaps my heart too would be filled with joy and an appreciation for the truth. At last, Horisada is ready to hear the verses, Sutasoma thought. It is the right time to reveal them to him. Aloud, he said, listen carefully, and I will recite the truths exactly as I heard them from the Brahmin Nanda. Sutasoma delivered the four truths so beautifully that the devas in the six sensuous heavens all gave one great cry of appreciation. These truths, which had first been proclaimed by Kasapa Buddha, were so eloquently recited by the wise Sutasoma that Purasada was overwhelmed. 
His body was filled with the five kinds of joy and his mind began opening to the truth. Sutasoma stroked his friend's back and said gently, my friend, I have just tamed the cruel and wicked wretch that you were. I will reestablish you in Varanasi. If I fail in that, I will divide my own kingdom and give half of it to you. Kurosada's love for his kingdom and his desire to live there once again was awakened by Sutasoma's words. He was sure that he could depend on his old friend not only to protect him, but also to reestablish him as king as skillfully as he had established him in virtue. Friend Sutasoma, Kurosada cried, when heavy rain falls on a river, the water stays and swells the current. In the same way, friendship with the good can be trusted to endure. I now understand that nothing is better than fellowship with a virtuous friend. Sutasoma led Porasada out of the jungle. As they traveled through the countryside, people brought Sutasoma food and presents and followed in his train. By the time he reached Varanasi, he was accompanied by a large crowd. A proclamation accompanied by a drum was made throughout the city. Citizens, do not be afraid. King Sutasoma of Kuru assures us that Brahmadatta has been tamed and established in righteousness. We are allowing him to re-enter the city. You have nothing to fear. Impatient to have him back, the citizens of Indapata sent a message urging their king to return. King Sutasoma, however, stayed in Varanasi for one month. When it was time to leave, he bade fond farewell to the former Porasada, now once again recognized as King Brahmadatta. Be zealous in virtue, friend, he encouraged the king. Have alms halls erected at the city gates and at your palace door. Be generous and righteous. Observe the 10 duties of a king. Be vigilant against all evil desires and evil deeds. For the rest of his life, King Brahmadatta ruled righteously, performed good deeds, gave generous alms, and observed the moral law. Having concluded his story, the Buddha identified the birth. At that time, Angulimala was Porisada, and I was King Sutasoma. So there we have it. The story of Angulimala, the story of the Buddha, the story of the so-called man-eater, a story of transformation. And so as you sit with this story, go back, read it over and over and over again, as much as you like. You can um, focus in on the path, the way of the different characters. You can reflect on your own path and see if there's any connection there um, in terms of contemporary issues. We have the, the idea of addiction. We have the idea of transformation, which is timeless um, focus that one can have and see how it applies in your own life personally. And of course, experience the joy of the story, experience the joy of reading the story aloud, of hearing the words, um, how they rest in you, how, they, how the words fall for you from the screen. Um, where, where do you feel them? Where do you feel the message uh, of the story? Experience all of this in joy and in peace, in happiness, and in learning, and in study. And so we will take one more cleansing breath to allow all that good resonance from the story to experience that within our bodies, breathing in through the nose again and releasing it also through the nose. Let's take a deep breath. And releasing. And I thank you, thank you for joining me. Thank you for reading aloud and along with me. And I look forward to seeing you for the next chapter, Patel. Be well, peace.